Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's me, Arnok Dashkutu from Bangladesh, Corporate Ambassador of Institute of Global Professionals. The mission of this institution is to empower people from all over the world, especially the job seekers and the job holders, by providing effective training and consultation. For the students, the mission of Institute of Global Professionals is to empower them to better their lives and to contribute positively to the organization and communities in which they work and live. We accomplish this by providing quality higher education. We serve students locally, nationally, and internationally through our respective campus locations and distance learning formats. Our sessions are conducted by globally renowned professionals. People who are joining with us today, I'm cordially welcome you all. We hope that the webinar will help you to enlighten your knowledge in various sectors. Hope you'll enjoy and stay with us till the end. We have already completed 28 webinars successfully and our last webinar was on business automation. Today, we, have, we are presenting the webinar 29 on emotional intelligence. And today our guest speaker is Sherry Gilbert Ramsey-Mam. Sherry Gilbert Ramsey-Mam is a licensed psycho, uh, psychopathist and is the CEO of George Psychopathy and wellness service. She's also the CEO or co-founder of Scholar Nanny Collective. Sherry has been a corporate trainer for over 20 years. Sherry Gilbert Ramsey, also known as CSI of self-diversity, utilized her 20 years in law enforcement and 14 years as a licensed psychopath, psychotherapist to bring practical real world experience to her coaching mentoring and speaking is a fusion of first-hand experience and knowledge of the human mind that lead her create her coaching platform the csi experience that involves the use of critical thinking analytical skills to, in, to investigate and assist others in the journey of discovering their true potential if you have any question during the presentation please write down in the comment box. We will try to answer them as far as possible. Today, we are happy to have her conduct this webinar. Let's welcome Sherry Ma'am to the Institute of Global Professionals. We'd love to introduce our today's guest, Sherry Ma'am. Hello, Ma'am. Welcome in Institute of Global Professionals. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's morning here. I'm in the United States. I understand it's evening where you are but it's morning where I am. So hello everyone, I'm happy to be here. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about emotional intelligence, but he did a very good job of introducing me, but I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about myself. First of all, my name is Sherry Gilbert Ramsey. I am a licensed psychotherapist and I have been for the last 14 years. I also was in law enforcement for 20 years and I had a chance to work in various aspects of law enforcement to include investigations um, and other aspects, community relations. I decided to become a psychotherapist and I am a licensed psychotherapist. I'm here in the United States. I'm located in the state of Georgia. And I specialize in family and children therapy. I have made it my life's mission to teach others about emotional intelligence and te and I also do business coaching as well. And so with my business coaching, I like to teach people about themselves. And, and the most important thing you'll ever learn is learning about yourself because a journey of self-discovery is it lasts a lifetime. And it's probably the most important journey you'll ever take. So let's get right into emotional intelligence if you have any questions please drop them in the feed and i will try to answer them as soon as possible so you may ask yourself what is emotional intelligence first of all emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize emotions not only inside of ourselves but also inside of others. So I know you may ask yourself because the beginning of my presentation says something about a fingerprint. 
and what a fingerprint is. A fingerprint or your DNA is just like emotional intelligence. When people go to solve crimes, your fingerprint or your DNA is always left behind at a crime scene. It's always left behind. You always leave some type of DNA or some type of impression with others if you encounter them, once you encounter them. And so your emotional intelligence is just like DNA. Why? Because anytime you encounter someone, you leave something with them. You leave a lasting impression. You leave something behind. You leave a feeling behind. So I want everybody to just chat in the chat feature. Let us know what is something or someone that you have encountered that caused you to feel something. You never forget that person. For me, it's my first teacher. My first teacher made me feel like I was the, I was the smartest person in the world. Uh, I later begin to realize because I'm in education myself also now um, that it was her job to make me feel that way. But I remember that for the rest of my life. So who who is someone that made you feel like you'll never forget them? So I'm going to look in the chat feature. So let's see if someone says, like, who made you feel? Okay, I'm looking. Okay, so I'm going to keep going because we're going to we're going to ask a ask questions at the end as well. So. Your emotional intelligence is a lasting impression that you leave behind, regardless of who you come in contact with. And it's the most important thing that you'll leave behind. Um, what makes a successful business? We look at big businesses like Nike or um, Samsung. We look at a lot of big businesses and there are a lot of businesses that are similar, meaning they're very equally successful. And the reason why they're successful equally, even if they have the same products, even if they their clients are the same, is because they're both unique and they have both created a unique fingerprint, a unique um, brand that people can love. I like, I don't know if you know about uh, Adidas or Nike, but those, those shoes... You think about both of the two shoes. They're both equally successful. And they both can be equally successful because they're both unique. I have both in my closet. I look in my closet, I have both. And both of them are equally successful. So why do we need to learn about emotional intelligence? First of all, because 75% of all careers are derailed within the first couple of years because of emotional intelligence. We know that in business, we build, we build people. We don't build businesses, we build people. And the people that we build help build the business. And so emotional intelligence is the most important aspect of any career or a business and any relationship that you will encounter. Emotional intelligence is very, very important. Why is it important? Like I said, it's as unique as, a, as your DNA, as unique as a fingerprint. It helps you to stand out from other businesses, other people, and it helps you to leave a lasting impression. Our ability to interact and relate to others is directly connected to our ability to not only identify, understand, but also being able to manage our emotions. Until we master understanding, identifying, and managing our emotions, we cannot be effective leaders. We cannot be effective collaborators. 
and we could not be effective in our relationships. And we also have to be aware of our own strengths and our own limitations as it relates to emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is just like self-discovery. I know you heard at the beginning that I deal with self-discovery. And emotional intelligence is a lot like self-discovery. And it's a it's an ever-learning subject that you're always going to know more about. You're going to learn more about yourself. You're going to le learn more about others as you go throughout life. So I'm going to ask you to ask, tell you, ask you in the chat feature, can anybody tell me somebody that made you remember them, that left a lasting impression in your life? Can anybody tell me who made a lasting impression in your life? Let me see if I can see in the chat feature if anybody can let me know. Okay. Okay, someone say emotional intelligence knowing and understanding others' emotions. Somebody say emotional intelligence is self-discovery. That's correct. Someone said emotional intelligence is about handling personalities and self-discoveries. Correct. That's how you know. If you're emotionally intelligent by discovering yourself. Someone said a little girl almost at, at an age of nine that they can remember someone who made a lasting impression. Somebody said a classmate. Someone said their teachers in elementary and high school. Someone said their parents. Someone said their advisor. Someone said they remember their elementary teacher before because of unfair treatment of her learners. Yes, we can leave good or bad lasting impressions. All impressions are not good. Some are bad. Someone said students, my father. Someone said their father was their first karate instructor. Okay. See if I see any others. Okay. Wonderful. So we all know that there are people in our lives that come in our lives and leave those lasting impressions with us. Someone said their music teacher. We still have comments coming in the section and said someone said their music teacher. Um, someone said their father again. So there are people who stand out in our lives. So my Angelo said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. They'll forget most, almost all of what you say. They will forget some of what you did. People will forget some of what you did. But people will never, ever forget how you make them feel. They will never forget how you make them feel. And that's why emotional intelligence is so, so important. So this unique fingerprint that I am talking about and that we are going to talk about today makes up our emotional intelligence. So what makes up our emotional intelligence and it makes us stand out and makes us unique and makes us leave a lasting impression. First of all, is self-awareness, self-management, mindfulness. We have self-compassionate, self-care, communication, and social awareness. These are the seven principles that help us stand out, helps to create our emotional intelligence and help us to be unique and helps us to understand not only ourselves, but understand others. So just looking at this, 
even if you don't know anything about emotional intelligence, you can probably look at this chart and identify areas of strength and weakness for you as far as what you may need to work on or what you're already good at. So just looking at this chart, if you can chat in the chat feature, just let me know what area would you like to more, more, sorry, what area would you like to know most about today? What area do you think that you want to know more about today? So out of these seven, what area would you like to know more about? For me, it is self-care. Someone said communication, okay? What area of weakness do you see? I'm looking in the chat feature. Someone says self and social awareness, okay? Anyone else see any other weaknesses? Someone says they want to know more about self-management. Self-care and self-management. Self-care is a big one for people to know more about that. Because we we often take, we're often taking care of everyone else that we don't think about ourselves. And so self-management is a big part of emotional intelligence that people don't recognize, people don't understand. Yes, and because we have, I saw someone say something about the pandemic because at this time, with everything going on in the world, it's more important to know about self-care. It's more important to know how to take care of ourselves. We cannot, we cannot pour from an empty cup. Cannot pour from an empty cup. Someone said communication, self-awareness, and social awareness. Okay. So I see a lot of people saying that there are things that they need, may need to work on as it relates to emotional intelligence. And that's great because we're going to touch on all of those things today. We're going to touch on all seven of those things today. Self-awareness. Self-awareness is probably the most important aspect of emotional intelligence. Why? It's because it's how we relate to others. People who are self-aware understand that their emotions do not rule them, that they're, they understand their emotions, they're intuitive, they know how to control their emotions, and they know how to interact with others. Being self-aware also allows us to be able to hone in on our strengths and to know our strengths and to know our weaknesses and know how it affects us. Self-awareness is the most important part of emotional intelligence because until you are self-aware, you cannot learn or know about others' emotions until you know about your own. You won't know how to create boundaries. You don't know your morals. You don't know your values. You don't know your triggers. You don't know. Self-awareness is the most important part of emotional intelligence. So what you learn stuff about yourself every day. Self-awareness is learning every day. What is it about my emotions that I need to work on? People don't aren't aware of this. And I tell my kids because I'm, I'm a school counselor as well. I tell my kids, a lot of times when we think of emotions, we think about happy and sad. We think about the basic emotions. How many of you know that there are over 300 emotions? There are over 300 emotions. And 
I challenge you to try to think about how many you know of. Most people say they know around 10 to 15, maybe even 20. But how many of you know that there are over 300 emotions? Just, I'm just interested to know. Chat in the chat feature. Let me know how many emotions do, are you aware of before today? How many emotions can you think of in your head? I can, uh, you know, before I started studying about emotional intelligence, I knew the basic emotions, but there are over 300 emotions and that, and we don't even utilize the knowledge of all of them. So how many, how many of you know, tell me how many emotions do you know of? Someone says it's their first time knowing. Someone said, no, they didn't know that there were over 300 emotions. Someone says a lot. Okay. Someone said they know about 50. That's a good number. 50 is a good number. Yes, there are over 300. Okay. So good. We all know about emotions. We may not have known that there were over 300, but we all know that there are emotions and we know that we need to be aware of them, especially in ourselves. So how can we gain awareness of our emotions? First of all, we can keep an emotions diary. I challenge you to look up how many emotions there are. Look them up and write them down. Keep a diary every day of how many emotions you go through. We go through about 30 to 40 emotions a day. Can you imagine? A person goes through about 30 to 40 emotions a day from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to sleep at night. You will experience between 40 30 to 40 different types of emotions. Um, you may wake up. You wake up in the morning. You feel good. You're going throughout your day. Everything is going great. Um, you may get a phone call that morning. You got to go into work. You thought you were off, but your boss calls you and say, hey, we need you to come into work. So you go from feeling happy and restful, thinking you're going to be off. And then the next thing you know, you're going to get called into work. And then you feel stressed. You feel um, nervous. You feel frustrated. You feel anxious. You feel all type of different types of emotions. Or you may wake up in the morning and you think you're going to get rest. And then they say there's no school today. So your kids have to stay at home with you today. So you thought you were, may were going to get some rest and you can't get any rest. And then something else happens throughout the day. And then something else happens throughout the day. And then you go to work and then you you get a reward at work or recommendation or a commendation. Someone says, good job. Someone gives you praise and you feel good. And then you may speak to your spouse and something else happens and your spouse may be upset with you. And so you get sad or you get angry. And so you go through this tug of war of emotions all day long. All day long, you go through this tug of war of emotions. So it's important to learn and know what those emotions are. And the first part of knowing and learning about those emotions is being able to write them down in a diary. How many of you have diaries? I mean, I'm interested to know how many people keep diaries and actually write in them. Someone says something important. They said they, they feel like they experience exhaustion without even moving. That's so that's so true. We do experience exhaustion without even moving. Sometimes we experience exhaustion because of the different emotions going through our head throughout the day. And those emotions can wear us down without us even having to move. Sometimes I think about what I have to do today and I have all types of emotions. I'm going through 30, 40 emotions without even moving because I'm thinking about everything I have going on throughout the day. So 
if you know that you go through 30 to 40 emotions a day, I think it's a good job to set an intention for today. And what is an intention? An intention is setting a goal for your day. So you know how your day, you want your day to go. Because believe it or not, when we set an intention, most of the time, that's how our day goes. If we say, today I'm going to have a great day. No one's going to throw me off. I'm not going to get angry today. Not going to feel sad today. I'm going to have a good day. When you think those thoughts, you process that in your brain and your brain tells you to make sure this happens and you strive for that goal. And you may go through little bumps throughout the day. People may say things to you throughout the day. You may get upset throughout the day, but when you set that intention, no one's going to throw me off today. I'm not going to feel um, sad today. I'm not going to be angry today. You strive for that. And in your mind, you set that intention. And even if you did, even if you did have a not so good day, because you set that intention, your day is better. It feels better. Even if you're sad, you don't notice it. Even if you are angry, you, you work through it. So someone said they their diary is listening to music. I love music. I love, I saw, see someone, Miss Adina said positive affirmations. I love positive affirmations. Someone says they write poems. I love writing poems as well. Sometimes I write poems. Sometimes I write songs. Those are great ways to, to express those emotions on paper. Someone says they've written paper and put it in a jar. I have a jar as well in my house. I call it a blessing jar. And when good things happen to me, I write it down. I write it down and I put it inside my blessing jar. And inside of my blessing jar, usually I keep a blessing jar throughout the year. And then when I'm having a bad day or when I'm you know, cranky or I'm sad or I feel angry, I go in that jar and I pull out something good that happened to me. Maybe it was a week ago. Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. But I pull out something that... I can look at that shows me that this world is not all bad. There are good things that are happening to me because sometimes we can get so stuck in thinking about all the negative things that happen to us that we don't realize all the good things that happen to us throughout the day. So I challenge you to keep that kind of jar. You can write down your positive things that happen to you. And so I usually keep one for a whole year. And guess what? Every when the new year comes or at a time of the year where I want to get ready to set goals for the next year, I open that jar and I look in that jar and I pull out all the good things that happen to me. Because like I said, we can get so stuck thinking about all the bad things that happen to us that we never think about those good things. And we need those good things. We need those positive thoughts. Someone says having a positive thoughts brings about emotional awareness. It does. It does. So I see a lot of people saying they have a diary. That's awesome. Okay. Someone says they have a diary. Somebody says a weird emotion is usually done at the end of the day by analyzing. That's that's an awesome thought because guess what? I was just going to talk about that. And that's called reflection. How do we gain awareness? We gain awareness also through reflection. And so what is reflection? Reflection is going back at the end of the day and looking at everything that happened to us throughout that day. Looking at everything that happened to us. And so when we think about the things that happened to us throughout the day and we write them down, we can see where our emotions changed. We can see things we could have done differently. How many of you have said something or encountered someone and you, you were talking to them and you said the wrong thing. And then when you finish saying it, or later on, you said to yourself, gosh, I wish I would have said that differently. I wish I would have thought about it differently. 
or you said, gosh, I forgot to say this to someone, or I should have said this. We do that all day long. Well, I should have said something, or I could have said something different. Well, guess what? When you reflect upon what happened, you build resilience. And in building that resilience, you can set an intention for when you encounter that same type of situation that next time, even if you didn't do it that time, next time I talk to that person, I can handle that differently. Or next time I communicate with this person, I can handle the, handle it a little differently. And so reflection is very important. And in your emotion diary, you also need to write reflection. So at the end of the day, I love whoever said that. At the end of the day, write a reflection. This is what happened to me throughout the day. Reflect on your day, how it went, how many times your emotion changed. What do you notice in your body? Your, your body will tell you everything you need to know about yourself. It will tell you what your emotions are, how you react to stress. What happens to your body? Me, my stomach starts hurting. When I know I'm upset or something's going on with me, my stomach hurts. My head hurts. I may start sweating profusely. There are different things that happen to my body. I, I get headaches. So I just want to hear from some people. What are some of the things that you notice about your body that tells you that something is going on with you? What are you noticing in your body? For me, I told you it's headache or a stomach ache. Those are my signs that something stressful is going on in my body. Someone said when they're stressed, they can't sleep well. Someone said, Miss Jessica said she could stay calm even if her day was bad. I, that's that's a good thing to. That means that you may be aware of your emotions if you're if you can be calm through situation it means that you're aware of your emotions someone said reflecting back is the best solution someone they said they can't stay calm under pressure pressure someone said they would vomit that's very intense i i think you will remember things that happened to you before you vomited before that happens like what happened to me right before i vomited oh somebody said this to me or somebody did this to me Someone says they feel calm under pressure. Someone says they cry silently. So there's a lot of different things that happen to us. And our bodies help tell us what is going on inside of our bodies. And tell us what is what are going on with our emotions and, and lets us be aware of those things. So once we know for a fact what those emotions are by keeping that emotion diary by reflecting once we know what those things are and how they can affect us then we can self-manage and then we know what to do to help us manage those emotions okay now we know the emotions we've identified them we said there were over 300 of them now we know them now we got to figure out what triggers those emotions. So that that diary and that reflection journal is going to help you also know what triggers those emotions. What behavior patterns? Do you notice the behavior patterns that happen when you get angry, when you get sad? What when you feel that emotion, what are the patterns? And it also, once we're aware, it allows us to be accountable for, for those emotions. So somebody has to be held accountable for the emotions. So we have to hold ourselves accountable because sometimes people are not going to tell us what we're doing. And so it's important for us to know and hold ourselves accountable when dealing with emotions. So how can self-management help us first of all self-management help us helps us to have productivity if you're angry at work or in your relationship or at home or if you're just angry in general it it decreases your productivity you can't work you can't think 
you can't do anything because you're so upset that you're thinking about everything else. And so in it, in order to maximize your productivity, you must know self-management skills. It helps improve workplace performance. If you know you work with someone who may not, you may not get along with, you know how to either avoid that person or deal with those emotions. If you know how to self-manage, if you recognize them, then you will know how to deal with that person or how not to deal with that person. It will also increase your accountability and it will increase your time management skills. Think about how much time that you spend thinking about things that you're upset about or things that have you stressed out or things that are going on that you can't control. How, how many how many times do we think about things that we can't control? We know we can't control. And so it also helps us to take initiative. Because once we know those emotions and once we know how to manage those emotions, we can take the initiative to do something about it. And so that's why self-management is very important. So can anybody tell me, do you know your own triggers? Are you able to recognize your triggers? And if so, what are some of your triggers? I want to see if some of you know some of your triggers. Do you know that self-management also, while I'm waiting on someone to put in a trigger, do you know self-management also is about your ability to say no? Because if you know that a certain person or a certain thing triggers you, you may need to avoid that situation. And so can you say no? Do you know how to say no? So let me see who can tell me what triggers them. Does anybody know what triggers them? Someone says they get scared. That's a good sign that you know what triggers you. If you get scared, you know what happens to your body when that happens. Someone said my triggers are brainstorming. Someone says when they get criticized. I see some people know. They know about self-management. They know the triggers. And that's the important part. So it's, it's self-awareness is the key, but self-management is really what we're striving for once we are aware. Okay, I see some people coming in. We're going to keep going while I wait for people to just put in, you know, what are your triggers? What are your patterns? So you can hold yourself accountable. So we talked about how do we self-manage? Self-management is, is very important. How do we self-manage? First of all, by saying no. You got to know when to say no. How many people here don't know when to say no? Don't know how to say no? Sometimes in difficult situations, it's hard for us to say no, especially I'm, a, I'm what we call an empath. And so sometimes it's hard for me to say no to people. But I don't like feeling stressed out. I don't like feeling like scared and anxious. And so I've learned to say no for my self-care. And we'll talk about self-care later on. But saying no is a part of self-managing, but it's also a part of self-care. You got to know when to say no. How many people know when to say no? Someone says they know how to say no. Pay attention to self-talk. A lot of times when we're going through different emotions, it's not the things we say, but it's the things we say to ourselves inside our head. Sometimes we can talk ourselves up, meaning we can escalate a situation. When I'm talking about conflict resolution, we can escalate a situation or we can 
we can decrease the situation. We can we can um, bring that situation to a point where we can handle it if we know the negative self-talk that we say to ourselves inside of our head. And so that takes also reflection and being aware of our weaknesses. What do you think being aware of our weaknesses has to do with self-managing? What does being aware of our weaknesses have to do with self self-management? Someone says it's hard to say no, but we must learn to do it. I agree. It's something that we have to do for ourselves. Someone says, I only say no if I cannot do anything. No is a difficult word to other, afraid to offend. Sometimes we're afraid, we are afraid to offend others by saying no. But we have to do it for ourselves sometimes. Sometimes it's imperative. Sometimes it's necessary for us to be able to say it. And it is hard to say it. You have to practice saying it. And the thing about it is you have to practice saying it without explanation sometimes. We're always so used to saying no and saying, no, I can't do this because of this, this, and that. And when we do that, do you realize that when you give a reason after you say no, then you give that other person room to wiggle back in and say, oh, well, oh, you can't do it because of this, but I can do that for you. Let me give you an example. If you say no, I if someone asks you, could you go to the store for me? And you know you don't have time to go to the store for that person because you have so much to do. You have your own things to do. You have X, Y, and Z to handle. But you say, no, uh, well, I can't go to the store because I'm really supposed to uh, pick up John from work. That person might say, well, you know what? I'll get somebody else to pick up John so you can handle what I need you to handle. So when you say no and then you give a reason, you give a person the ability to overstep your boundaries because no is your boundary. No is your boundary that you've set. And when you say no, but, or no, I can't because, you give someone the opportunity to overstep that boundary. So let me look in the comments. Someone said, telling someone no is the power. That's your power. That is your is your power. Saying no, um, positivity is the best in situations. Okay. Someone says they feel guilty. Yes, you will feel guilty sometimes if you have to say no. But no is sometimes necessary. Especially if you know yourself. And and we talked about accountability because accountability is important. And you got to hold yourself accountable. If you know that you are a type of person who is not organized, you don't effectively manage your time, you won't get your th things that you need to get done if so you don't know how to say no. So I still see people saying that it's hard for them to say no. And I understand that. So what happens when we let negative talk or our emotions, because sometimes we're not aware of those emotions. We're not aware of that negative self-talk. What happens when we let it control us? Sometimes we can let our emotions control, take control. So what happens is emotional hijacking. And emotional hijacking is your primitive emotions take over your thought process so you're unable to view a situation realistically and objectively. Sometimes in emotional hijacking, we perceive danger or a threat that sometimes is real and sometimes it's just made up inside of our heads because we have allowed those emotions to take control. And they take control of our amygdala, which is the part of our brain um, that perceives that fight, flight response, fight or flight. And so that's what causes anxiety. When we feel that fight or flight response, 
our emotions have definitely taken over. And so it's important to know them so you don't let them take over. And so our response, our brain response is 80 to 100 times faster when emotional hijacking occurs than when we are thinking rational. And so it happens so quick. We don't even know it has taken over because our brain processes those emotions 80 to 100 times faster than when we are thinking rationally. We call this a distorted perception. So we have this distorted perception of what's going on. Sometimes it can be real. Sometimes it's just our perceived thoughts that have taken over. And so our amygdala can also, it's like a memory bank. So it can pull up those thoughts and emotions from previous times that we experienced something similar. It doesn't have to be the same situation, but sometimes our mind can take little pieces of what we experience. And if we encounter something similar, even if it's minute, our brain will run with it. And we, we're back into feeling the same way or the same emotion that we felt during the previous time. I'll give you an example. If I witness a plane crash or something like that happen, and somebody close to me, you know, you know, something happened to them on a plane. If I ever decide to ride a plane again, or if I decide to get on an airplane, my thoughts are going to be running and racing because I'm going to be remembering what I saw or what I felt at that time. And I'm not going to, even though there's no perceived threat in the present, my fight flight response is going to take over because I'm only thinking about what I felt when not my friend or my loved one, something happened to them on a plane. And so I'm thinking, and that's, and I know you're probably thinking, this sounds like anxiety, and it is. It's how anxiety happens because of that emotional hijacking. So how many of you have ever been through a situation and when you experience something similar, it doesn't have to be, totally similar to that last situation, but you automatically became anxious. Does anybody become anxious because they have felt something happening to them, but they weren't totally sure what was going on. They just felt that fight or flight response. Let me look in the comment section for a minute. Let me see what some people are saying. Okay. So Some people said they're analyzed other pe person's perspective. I see some other comments. Somebody, someone says they have the gift of feeling how others feel. It, sometimes they feel overly empathetic. Someone says sometimes I become sensitive to others' needs. Someone said no, depending on the situation. Someone said your emotions, okay, yes. So I see people coming in. So emotional hijacking is very important to understand because once you are aware of the emotions, you know your triggers, you will know how to control those emotions. So emotional hijacking does not occur. Social awareness. So how do we become more socially aware? Let me see in the chat feature if you can tell me how many people can tell me what do you think you need to be more socially aware? I know you see what's on the screen, but what do you think needs to be added to this? How do we become more socially aware? Someone says they sympathize and empathize with others.
putting your feet in someone's shoes, empathy. Definitely. Someone says it's human management. Yes, it is. Social awareness is human management. Someone says emotions are created by us so we can control it. That's true. Um, empathy and sympathy are very important parts of social awareness. So social awareness and empathy. Social awareness, first of all, allows us to accurately read situations and people because and it helps us to understand and empathize with people. So I don't know if I told you at the beginning, but I know you. I told you I worked in law enforcement, but I worked in hostage negotiation as well. So we use something what we call tactical empathy. Um, tactical empathy is basically not agreeing or disagreeing with someone, but it's more about validating and letting a person talk. Because a lot of times in social situations, we just want somebody to listen to us. We don't want anybody to disagree with us. Have you ever just wanted to talk to somebody and they always want to disagree? It's not a good conversation. Sometimes you just want people to listen. And empathy is sometimes it's about putting yourself in other shoes, but it's also about validation, validating someone's feelings. Social awareness is also about knowing your biases. And so in order to know how you're going to react to something or know about your what emotion you will invoke during a situation, you got to know, you have to know about those biases. You have to know what are your likes and dislikes? What are your stereotypes? What are things that you were told that may not be true? What are things that you are told that you know are true, but you still act upon them? And also, what are your boundaries? What are your colleagues' boundaries? What are the people around you boundaries? And so social awareness is grounded in our ability to recognize and understand the emotion of others. So we know about our emotions. We know how to manage our emotions. Now we got to know how to know about the emotions of others. It allows us to pick up on those social cues and to be in tune with the needs of those around us. Social awareness is important in relationships, any type of relationship, in business, in life, in your personal relationship. It's important to be aware. This allows us to show empathy, set boundaries, and we it helps us to understand the intent behind someone's actions. So how many of you ever, when you're talking to somebody, how many of you ever think about why they did something or why they said something? We rarely do that, right? We rarely think about the intent of someone else. But when you dig into the intent of what someone else did or said, that's when you learn about their emotions, you learn about their needs, you know, you learn about their wants, their desires, what drives them. How many of you really think about why someone did something? I'm a parent. I have a, a son. So as a parent, I always say to myself, why did my child do this? Even when, especially when he does something that I know that I didn't teach him or, you know, I can't figure out why he did it. I'm always thinking to myself, why did he do that? What caused him to do this? How many of you have employees? How many of you think about why your employees do certain things? This is all a part of social awareness. I'm going to go to the chat feature for a minute. Someone says setting boundaries is important. When you empathize with people, you build a connection and relate. 
we should respect others' emotions. I agree. I do listen to others' patience and understanding. That's a very important word. Thank you for saying that. Understanding. I see Mr. Joy say understand. Understanding is of importance. And we'll talk about that when we get to communication. But understanding, not only putting yourself in someone's shoes, but understanding. Someone says, I listen to others with patience and understanding. I see a lot of people saying about understanding. Okay, someone says they listen, showing empathy to others is important. Great. So we know that social awareness is of the utmost importance because it helps us to not only know more about ourselves, but about others. It's called, it's relationship management. And that's important in all aspects of life. It's in, in romantic, in your romantic relationships, in your friendships, in business, in life, and in social awareness, there are three C's, and they are very, very, very important. The three C's are communication, compromise, and commitment. So if you remember that when it deals with social awareness, you'll be you'll be very successful. Communication, compromise, and commitment. How many of you take the time to understand someone else's point of view before trying to Persuade them about yours. And we'll talk about that in communication as well. Sometimes we're not we're we're not into that social awareness. So sometimes instead of and this is between empathy and communication. So sometimes you don't have to understand someone else's point of view. But as you talk to them, if you listen for understanding. And you just listen to understand instead of persuade. You will learn what their emotions are. You will learn what they're trying to tell you. They will give you the blueprint to understanding them. If you just listen instead of trying to persuade. A lot of times when we communicate, we communicate to get someone to understand our point of view instead of understanding their point of view. So listening to understand and not persuade can be hard. I'm interested to know how many of you can do that. How many of you can listen to understand and not persuade? Even if you, especially if you don't agree with someone's um, morals or values or standards, but you're just listening to understand them, understand their emotions, but not to persuade them. Someone says that strong group is, is good to provide comfort zone to others. Someone says they're self-motivated. Someone says they have a great deal of self-discipline. We need to listen and understand their point of view, yes. Listen to their partner, understand. See a lot of teachers in here. That's awesome. Um, I probably didn't say this at the beginning as well, but I work at an international school. And so I get to learn about different cultures and, and kind of try to understand what motivates others through their culture. And so I think if we just listen to people, to listen for that understanding instead of, wanting someone to be like us or take our point of view, it allows us to be open and learn more about others. Listen to understand is a difficult thing to do, but I would try to improve. And that's all that's all emotional intelligence is about. It's not about perfection. Emotional intelligence is about knowing your weaknesses, knowing your strengths, working on your weaknesses and building upon your strengths. It's not about perfection. 
And you, like I say, emotional intelligence is something that is ongoing. So it's not something that happens overnight. It's it, it happens every day. Every day I learn something new about myself. I, I, I at the beginning I told you I'm the CSI self discovery. Self discovery is ongoing. You learn something new about yourself every day. Okay, someone says listen to understand and not persuade. This is exactly what I was saying. Okay, great. Someone says. How do you engage with senior colleagues who lack social awareness? You do it by, first of all, modeling. You can model social awareness for people so they can understand what it looks like. Our, sometimes our senior colleagues, our bosses, are not always leaders. Leaders are created. So a lot of people say leaders are born. Leaders are created. Leaders, of course, we are born with some leadership traits and we're born with leadership skills, but leaders are created. Sometimes we have to show our leaders what it looks like to be socially aware. They might not be empathetic with us, but we can still show them empathy. I'm going to give you a good example. I worked in a school and I had a principal and I, I my son um, he got sick one day. And so I told my principal, which was my boss at the time, I told her, I said, my son is sick. I need to go home and take care of him because he's sick. At this time, my son was in high school. And so my boss, who did not have any children, she said something. And, you know, I thought it was kind of insensitive. She said, well, your son is old enough where you shouldn't have to worry about him if he's sick. He should, he's old enough to drive to the hospital himself. And I was upset when I first heard her say that because I was like, to me, that was very insensitive. And I was like, she doesn't have kids, so I know she doesn't understand because I'm listening for I'm trying to be more aware of what her intentions are and why she said the statement she said. So I recognize that she does not have, a, you know, she was, she was a single lady. She did not have any children. She did not understand that your children are your children. If they get 50, 60, 70 years old, they're your children, and you're going to always have that nurturing spirit and take care of them regardless of their age. So I understand that she didn't understand that. So a couple of weeks later, her cat died and she was very upset. She didn't come to work she, for a week. She was very upset because her cat died. I could have used that moment to be like, you have taken a week off because your cat died. When I told you last couple weeks ago, my son was sick and you were not sensitive to that. But I did not do that. You know, I still show her an empathy because I wanted her to see what it looked like. I told her, I said, you know, what? I'm sorry your cat died. I gave her a card, you know, and said, you know, I'm sorry your cat died. If there's anything you need, let me know. And she was, it kind of changed her view of me. Because I had to show her, even though she was my senior, even though she was my boss, it was up to me to show her what empathy looked like. She wasn't aware of that. Even though she was a leader, she never was taught empathy. And so sometimes we have to show our bosses what empathy looks like. Let me go to chat. Sometimes I get irritated, easily in stressful situations. Leaders must recognize weaknesses of followers and be one of a good example. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's up to our leaders to be good examples, but sometimes they don't know. Because sometimes they choose leaders based upon seniority and things that have nothing to do with their ability to lead. And so sometimes we as employees, sometimes we have to show leaders things. And I don't know how many of you have employees yourself, but it's important to do what we call a... a um, a survey 
to find out what is the culture in your business. If you are an entrepreneur and you own a business, or if you have employees, even in your marriage, you can do the same thing to figure out what is the culture, meaning how are things going? Are they going great? What can we do better? What can we do to build upon the skills that we already have? What do we recognize as our weaknesses? Like I said, this can be done in business and in your personal life. A culture survey. What can we do to improve our ability to communicate? What can we do to improve our ability to be more empathetic? How can we be more aware of everything that's going on around us? Someone said a good leader is a follower. Yes, a, a good leader should also be able to follow because what leaders need to know is that they can learn from their employees. They can learn from the people around them. Everyone has something to bring to the table. At our school, our international school, every year we adopt a, a phrase that we want to embody our culture and our atmosphere for the year and for the last two years we ad adopted ubuntu ubuntu i am because we are we all have something to bring to the table everybody's voice is equal from the leader to the lowest man on the totem pole we're all equal we all have something to bring to the table someone says when you're stressed you're irritated See a lot of comments coming in. Good. Someone says they get irritated if they're stressed. So we have to work on that stress if, if you're irritated because it can affect your ability to be aware of others if you are irritated. Um, someone said a good leader is a good listener. Definitely. Definitely a good leader is a listener. So what about biases? Who can tell me that if you're aware of your biases? How many of you are aware of things that you were taught? Some things were passed down. Some things are intergenerational. A lot of our biases come from our families. Things we're taught. Things we may not even understand. Why we do them or why we say them, or why it's a part of our culture, or why it's a part of our everyday life. We just do them because someone else told us that that's how it's supposed to go, or that's what we're supposed to think, or those are the things we're supposed to say. So how many of you can tell me what your biases are? How many of you are rec can recognize your biases? Someone says self-awareness, learning your own strengths and weaknesses, always listening to viewpoints of others. Okay, I'm going to wait because the chat is kind of catching up. I want to know if you know about your biases. Excuse me, I'll take a drink. Someone said always, always listen to other viewpoints can contribute. Men and women are victims of their own biases. Yes, we can be victim of our own biases. Just to give you an example about biases, when, when I was growing up, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my, my great-great-grandmother had this saying. And the saying was, don't let the light, meaning the street light, beat you home. Don't let the street light beat you home. So what does that mean? So basically my great, great, great grandmother and everybody before her were saying when the lights come on on the street, we have street lights. The lights come on at a certain time. When the lights come on, you should be home. Why? 
usually because the lights don't come on until dark, until it's completely dark outside. It may not even be late, but they come on on their own and they come on at night. So that was our way of timing people and telling, you know, children when to be inside. Don't be outside after dark. Basically, that's the same. But my grandmother and her grandmother and her grandmother phrased it as don't let the porch light, don't let the street light beat you home. So what does that mean? For my great, great, great grandmother, I'm sure the reason why they came up with that, which is be home before dark is because in those days their slavery was alive and rampant and you just did not want to be outside of your plantation if it was already dark because you belonged to someone else at that time and you needed to be where you're supposed to be and accounted for now my grandmother told my mother this as well. Or my great-grandmother told my grandmother this. Now, slavery was not in the days of my grandmother. So why did her grand grandmother tell her that? Her grandmother instilled that in her. And so when my grandmother was coming up, it was the days of the uh, Ku Klux Klan or KKK, which were um, Nazi extremists. And different extremists and, and they did not want her to be outside during that time. So they would tell my grandmother, be outside, don't let the street light beat you home. So I'm sure that's why they told her that. Now come to my mother in the days of police brutality and things that are, were going on, on here in the US. They told my mother the same thing. My grandmother told my mother, don't be outside after dark. Why? Because you know, police would stop them. My mother got stopped by the police several times when she was a young girl. Um, so things would happen. So that was something that was passed on to me too. Now I haven't experienced the things that they have experienced, but that intergenerational trauma has been passed on and those biases have been passed on from generation to generation to generation. So what biases have you experienced or has been passed down to you through intergenerational um, traumas and different things that happened to your ancestors that you don't even realize that are biases, but you do them because you were taught that. Okay. So I'm looking. Anybody understand or recognize their, their biases? Someone say, come on before dark, it still exists. It does still exist. We just don't have to deal with some of the things that our ancestors dealt with, but it does still exist. And we still tell our kids to this day, be home before dark or be inside before dark. Okay, I'm still looking. Okay, so nobody knows about their biases. Um, okay, so we'll move on. Because some people don't know. Someone said following the generation to generation due to some serious problems phase. Okay, so some of us are do recognize our biases and some of us don't. I'll give you another good example. I, my grandmother used to we have something in America called Thanksgiving. And every Thanksgiving, we we cook a turkey. Well, I don't. There's a long, drawn out reason why we cook turkey and all that. But I won't explain that. <laughs> but I will explain that every time my grandmother got ready to cook her turkey, she would cut the turkey up and put it in a pot. Now, some people cook their turkey whole. Some people cut their turkey up before they put it in a pot but she would cut hers up. And so every, you know, from my great, great grandmother to my great grandmother, to my grandmother, to my mother, to me, we all cut our turkeys up. I had no idea why we cut our turkeys up. 
So one day I just did it because that's what I was told to do. You cut your turkey up and then you put it in the pot to bake it. One day I asked my grandmother, hey, why do we cut our turkey up? Like, why do we cut our turkey up and put it in the pot? Do we ever think to ask our ancestors, like, why we do things? You'd be surprised at the answers you get. My grandmother said, because when my mother used to cook her turkey, she always had those little pots and the turkey couldn't fit in the pot. So we, she just always used to cut it up before she put it in the pot. So I just start cutting mine up. And this has been passed on from generation to generation. We've been cutting our turkeys thinking that's how you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to cook it. And not even realizing that that's just something we were taught intergenerational that came down and we don't even know why we do it. So it's important to know about those things that are passed down to us. And you might, you, you need to know that there are 12 different kinds of biases. And we always need to learn how to set boundaries. Setting boundaries allows us to communicate our expectations. When we set boundaries, it communicates our expectations. To our children, we have to set, just like we set boundaries for children, we have to set boundaries for our employees. We set boundaries at work. We set boundaries with our spouses, our husbands, husbands and wives. We set boundaries because those are our rules and expectations, our values and our morals. And it's important to set those boundaries so people can respect them. Not only that, but you want to understand others' boundaries because if you overstep people's boundaries, you're not socially aware and you will create friction in your social relationship. So it's um, important that you ask your friends, people that you respect and people that you love, understand their boundaries and don't cross them. Seek out their boundaries. Ask them if they don't tell you you will notice them in their actions. It's important to know about people's boundaries. Okay. So how do we become more socially aware? First of all, listening. If we listen more to others, then we can be more socially aware. We talked about those boundaries. Verbal and nonverbal cues will help you Understand those boundaries. You can look at what somebody says or does, or you can look at the reaction, their body language. You can look at their body language and tell like things that are going on with them. Once someone says our boundaries are the rules, okay, great job. Age just let's say work life, personal balance. Someone said social awareness, focus on recognizing and understanding others' feelings. Someone says my no boundaries make you worth, worthless in other people's eyes. I agree. You have to, everyone has to have boundaries. We have to have boundaries. Someone said nonverbal communication is louder. Yes, your nonverbal communication speaks louder than your verbal communication. You can know exactly how people are feeling based upon just looking at their nonverbal cues. Someone says, when I see my family happy and healthy, Those are awesome answers. Great answers. Great answers. Boundaries need to be set before setting a goal. Yes, yeah, important. It's important to set boundaries. So, what what can you also do to help you set those boundaries and know those verbal and nonverbal cues? You can repeat what was said. If you see someone's um, you see someone and they're, you're talking to them, you're communicating with them, repeat what they said. It helps you to understand and be able to reflect upon what they were trying to tell you. 
Because sometimes when we're communicating, we misunderstand. We misunderstand. Um, I just want to thank everybody for the comments that are coming in. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. I am very happy with everyone's comments. Thank you for being participating and, and really digging in and, and thinking about how you want to become more emotionally intelligent. I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Um, but it also helps us understand society, people, and cultures when we're most so, more socially aware. It helps us to understand others. So sometimes we have to repeat what people say because sometimes we misunderstand. How many of you have ever said something to someone and realized later on that you may have misunderstood what they were saying? It's good to repeat what someone said and you can repeat to understand their intent. Hey, I heard you say this. Now, did you intend to mean this or that? Because interpretation is everything. Interpretation is everything. And I think I'm going to skip something. Hold on one second. Okay, so now that we're more socially aware, we need to know about relationship management. We, we know we're socially aware. Now we need to know about relationship management. Now that we have established that relationship, how do we, how do we keep that relationship good? How do we develop trust? How do we handle difficult behaviors? How do we engage with others? Once we establish that relationship, we have to keep the relationship going. Um, if you have a client base, if you're a client based business or if you have employees, know every customer, know everyone, not just your regulars. Relationship management is about building your customer base, knowing everyone, building trust. A customer or a client does not care what products you have what services you have or what you're selling until they know you care. I'm going to repeat that. A client or customer does not care what products you sell or what services you have or what you have to offer until they know that you care. And so relationship management is important. How do you deal with difficult behaviors? How do you deal with customer complaints? It's going to be important. How do you deal with others' difficult behaviors? You have to deal with customer complaints, just like you have to deal with if you have a spouse at home. If you deal with your children, you have to do it with patience. You have to establish that trust. And they have to know that you care. Um, you So many businesses collapse because of customer service-based issues because a client or a customer is looking at how well you're handling situations when and when it becomes difficult when there's conflict this will determine if a person is going to do business with you again or if they're going to wash their hands and they're not going to deal with you anymore how you handle them in that difficult situation and it's going to make the difference on whether or not they recommend your business or give you a good review or work, recommend your business to others Engagement is paramount in any relationship. It's the important part of the relationship. Thank you, everybody. I see those comments coming through. Thank you. Um, so how do you build that trust? By knowing all your customers, well, learning their needs. You're learning their emotional, what drives them, what draws them to you. You're going to learn um, what happens when they have difficult behaviors. How do you, how do you handle them? Do you handle them with patience and understanding um, and give them that customer service that they need? Are you engaged with them? Someone said, listen and show you're willing to understand. Someone said, yes, okay. Communication is the key. Communication is the key. Great. Engagement is the important part of the relationship. We want to build trustworthy 
Yes, we want to build trustworthy relationships. So how do we improve our relationship? First of all, we must accept and celebrate differences. I told y'all we're going to international school. It's very important when you're improving your relationship. You got to accept and celebrate differences. We are so easily um, into tolerating. Sometimes we just tolerate differences. We need to accept and celebrate those differences. We need to learn to give and take feedback. How many of us can take criticism? I saw a couple of people earlier saying that that was some of their weaknesses that they can't take criticism. It's hard sometimes to hear the bad stuff. Sometimes it's hard to hear the difficult stuff, but we need those things so we can be able to improve upon our relationships so we can build that trust so we can be proactive instead of reactive. When we improve on our relationships, we know Hey, you know, I know I said something to my wife. I looked at her body language. I understood that something was wrong with her. Now, let me go talk to her. Let me communicate with her or let me communicate with my husband so I can figure out how we can move forward or better our relationship. Be proactive. When you improve upon your relationship, you can be more proactive. And it also allows you to be able to validate validation of others feelings has nothing to do with our own feelings sometimes you don't have to agree with someone to validate their feelings hey you may not understand why they feel that way but you can say to them i respect your feelings i respect your emotions i respect what you're telling me because sometimes people don't want us to just understand they want us to understand, but sometimes if we can't understand and we're stuck in a point where we want to get our point across them, we just need to validate their feelings. Let them know, I see why you're upset. I see you're upset. How And ask them. You can ask the question, how can I mend our relationship? How can I be communicate with you better? How can help me better understand your point of view? And listen. So it's important to validate. It's very important. So accept and celebrate differences, learn to give and take feedback, build that trust and be proactive. Communication. Let's talk about communication for a minute. Communication, first of all, is understanding Managing that conflict and it also involves empathy as well. By understanding your emotions and how to control them, you're better, better able to express how you feel and how others feel as well. It also helps you to influence, persuade, and connect to others. Communication helps you to influence, persuade, and connect to others. And that's important. So communication helps us manage the conflict and it helps us develop that empathy. So let me go to the chat. Everyone said, um, thank you so much. I see people saying that this is helpful for them, um, that this webinar is insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for participating. Someone said compliment is part of validation. Do it once in a while. Don't be passive. Yes, I agree. I agree. It's a big help. Okay. Somebody said this is a big help in both personal and professional development. Great. I hope everyone's during, during this time um, that everything is going on in the world. I hope that everyone is working on their personal and professional development. It's very important to work on your personal and professional development. So how can we improve communication? First of all, the power of pause. Do you know about the power of pause? The power of pause involves how many of you get ready to send a text message or get ready to um, write something or you write something or a text message and you send it to that person, especially we, now that we have social media, now that we have um text messaging, emails, we may write something and send it to them and realize, oh my God, I did not like how that sounded. 
you realize I do not like how that sounded. How many of you sent something to someone and realized after you sent it that it did not, it was not reflected of, of how you really meant to say it or how you really felt? I know I've sent the text, uh, I sent the email to my boss one time and after I sent it, I was like, oh no, I can't believe I sent that. Because after sitting and thinking about it, once it was already sent, I was thinking to myself, I could have said that in a different way. I could have said that in a more positive way. And so we must take the power of pause before sending messages or talking or any type of communication because the power of pause allows us to think before we speak, think before we act, that pause. How many of you received an email or a text message from somebody and once you looked at it, you got upset or you got angry? And then you, after you read it a couple of times, you were like, oh, well, I don't think they meant to say this. I don't think your interpretation changed because you took the time to look it over. You took the time to think about it. I know a lot of time when I have looked at things, um, I, my cousin sent me a, a text message a while ago. And when I first looked at it, I was upset. I was immediately upset. But then I said, I'm going to, before I respond, I'm going to sleep on it. So I waited. I was not going to respond that same day. So the next day morning, I woke up and I read her text message again. And it sounded totally different because I wasn't in my emotions. I wasn't thinking about my emotions. I just read it with fresh eyes and reading with fresh eyes allowed me to see things from her point of view without taking it emotionally. So. Someone said, right, think before we act. Very important. Think before I understand the barriers communication is one way to improve. Someone said they sent a message in the group chat. And the next day they realized and discussed it with their friend. They realized it was too harsh. Yes, yeah, so it's important to take that power of pause. That's why it's important to take that time. Because sometimes we don't realize our brain is moving at the speed of lightning and we we don't realize till later on that we could have said something different or did something different so the way to improve that communication is take that time you don't have to answer a text message or an email or chat message or anything you don't have to answer it right then you can wait take that time to think take that time to learn about intent what 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 are they intending to say to me as the receiver of the message, what are they intending to say to me? What is my interpretation of the message? What was the sender trying to say? What do I want to what message do I want to convey when I talk back to them? What message? What tone? What what am I trying to convey? Active listening. Pick up the phone. Sometimes text message, emails. All of the things that we have going on in today's society is too much. Pick up the phone and call someone. Because sometimes you'll understand that what we read is not sometimes what we mean. And sometimes we misinterpret written language. And so sometimes it's best to pick up the phone. Why? Because over the phone, you can hear when somebody breathes, when somebody sighs. You can hear when they uh, say, if you know that person's emotion, if you're aware of that person's emotion, you can feel, feel, um, you can hear in their tone of voice. You can hear, pick up on those verbal communication things that you can't pick up on if you see something written. Or if you go face to face to that person and talk to that person, you can see those nonverbal cues. You can see those verbal cues and you'll know the message that they're trying to convey instead of seeing it written ask for feedback don't be afraid to ask for feedback when you're communicating with somebody ask for that feedback we're so we have gotten in a society where we don't like to be criticized but it's important in personal development and professional development to receive feedback ask people in any relationship how am i doing if you're in a marriage ask your spouse how am i doing how do we communicate how do i get better in your relationship with your boss. Ask for feedback. It only will allow you to grow. Feedback will allow you to grow. 
and know your audience. Before you communicate with someone, know your audience. It's important to know who you're sending the message to because who you're sending the message to is going to determine how you need to come across, how you need to send that message. Someone said, know how to listen to others and not talk too much. <laughs> That's very important. Le learning how to listen and not talking sometimes is hard, but yes, it's great. How do you overcome shyness in communicating to others? Well, first of all, you can practice with people that you're comfortable with. I know I practice sometimes, my husband don't even realize, but sometimes I practice talking to him like I would talk to others. Why do I do that? Because it allows me to do it with someone that I'm comfortable with. But a, being able to express myself. And so sometimes we have to step outside of that box and do things. Sometimes I practice talking in front of the mirror as if I was talking to that person. Sometimes I write down everything I'm going to say to the person before I go say it to them. Because sometimes I need to see how it looks. I practice in the mirror because I need to know how it sounds. And sometimes, guess what? I get a third party or someone to listen to me say it and tell me, hey, before I go talk to him about this or before I go talk to this person about this, can you listen to me say it? And then I read it to them or say it to them. And they're like, sometimes they'll give me feedback. Like, that's where that feedback comes in. Like, no, you should change a couple things. Or no, I wouldn't say that. Or I would change it. And then that allows you to get someone else to let you know if you're acting too harsh or if you're saying something that maybe you shouldn't say or if you need to rephrase what you're going to say. So when you talk to someone, make sure that you get feedback before you talk to them. Get someone else to listen to you first. Talk in the mirror. But it's always good to get someone else because you can be able to see or you get several people's perspectives on how it sounds before you go to that person or before you communicate with that person. I see a lot of people enjoying the webinar. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And so we know that communication is important. Communication is very important. Self-care. We cannot take care of others. We cannot understand our emotions. We won't be able to tap into those emotions unless we take care of ourselves. We have to make sure that we take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. I told you, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot pour from an empty cup. Self-care is important. Um, self Care is how we take care of ourselves. When do you know that people look at how you take care of yourself and they know how and that's how they treat you? They look at how you take care of yourself as a basis for how they can treat you. If you're mean to yourself, if you're not good to yourself, then if you don't have positive talk towards yourself, if you're always talking negative to yourself around people, they'll talk to you that way. It's important that you display self-care because it sets the precedence for how others will treat you. Someone said, if we're okay, then we can treat other people well. Yes, yes. Before you respond, someone to understand what they're saying first, what's the best thing to do when people are backbiters? When people are backbiters, the best thing to do is be yourself. One thing you'll learn in this world, you can't control what others, other people say and do, but you can control yourself. And a lot of times what I do is I take the high road. And if I don't trust somebody, we don't have a foundation of trust. I make sure I have a third party there when I talk to people. So if you have people that you don't trust in your circle or people that are saying things behind your back or doing things to... um sabotage your relationship or sabotage your work or different things. I like to have somebody there with me. I have someone with me when I talk to that person or I ask for a third party. Hey, can you sit with me while I talk to that person? Because sometimes we have people, we have people do what we call gaslighting. Gaslighting is when people do things to you. They do mean to things to you. They say things to you. They do things to harm you, but they pretend like they don't know what you're talking about. They pretend like they don't understand 
why you are upset. They make you mad on purpose and they pretend like, oh, why is she upset? Or why is he upset? When they know exactly what they're doing. You have to watch out for those kind of people because those kind of people can't be trusted. And you have to have someone else with you when you talk to them. Someone say, man, I suggest talk to them. Okay, someone's how to overcome stress, self-management, how to overcome from our stress. Okay. So how can we take care, better care of ourselves? What does that look like? Positive self-talk. Talking positive to yourself. Meditation. Reflection. Health and wellness. You, you know, you have to take care of yourself physically. You have to take care of your nutrition because it's going to directly affect your mood. It's going to affect your emotions. Sometimes we have to reboot. And rebooting sometimes means stepping away from social media, stepping away from work. We got to know when to put work to the side. We got to know when to say enough is enough. We got to know how, how to say no to some things that we said were difficult before. We got to know how to say no. We got to know about self-discipline. We got to know how to organize, how to organize our lives, how to organize ourselves. So I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm unorganized, I get really stressed out. When I don't have things planned, I get really stressed out. And that can lead to um, emotional overload or emotional hijacking. So we have to make sure that we reboot, step away, renew, refresh, relax. Self-care looks different from every, from, for everyone. Everyone takes different, um, does different things to take care of themselves. I like to go to the beach. I, I'm not a good swimmer, but I love to watch the beach. So when I need to reboot, you know what I do? I take, I go rent me a place on the beach and I just look at the water. And I read and do quiet time. That's my way of self-care. Self-care can be just taking a day to do nothing at all. Sometimes you don't want to do anything. Sometimes you want to make sure you're organized and you have things planned out. So your day goes better. It goes smoother. Someone says self-care is a task that we do every day. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it needs to be extreme because sometimes we can get so set in everything we do every day that it doesn't feel like self-care anymore. So sometimes we have to do, take a flight, do something extreme. But self-care is how we take care of ourselves every day. Self-compassion. Self-compassion is a very, very, very important part of emotional intelligence because when you learn how to forgive yourself, know that you make mistakes, then you will understand how to be more compassionate to others. When you are self-compassionate, you have better self-esteem because you're not worrying about what others think of you. You're not worried about criticism because you're able to take that criticism. You understand that what your weaknesses are. You understand where your strengths are. You're not living in that perfectionism because sometimes we could think that the world, that everything has to be perfect. But when we have self-compassion, we know that we're not perfect. We're imperfect people. We were made that way. And we make mistakes, and we but we can do hard things. We can get over that hump. We can learn from those mistakes. We can do better next time. We don't beat ourselves up every time we set out to do something and we're not successful in doing it. We understand that we can build upon those roadblocks and make it better for next time. I see some people saying self mm -hmm. Okay, great. How can we be more self-compassionate? First of all, positive self-talk, recognizing our strength, and mindfulness. Mindfulness is also a very important part of being self-compassionate, living in the here and now, knowing that the mistakes you make made yesterday have nothing to do with the mistakes you make today. Being mindful of the here and now. This is a new day. I have a new day to get things right. I know I made that mistake yesterday. It's okay. I'm looking at it with fresh eyes and I'm going to do better today. 
today I'm going to do better is a part of being more self-compassionate, being present focused, reflection, and also the using, using that power of pause because in mindful mindfulness, when you use that power of pause, you get to think about ways you can do things differently. That's also a part, part of mindfulness as well. I just want to thank everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for commenting in this in the chat section. Thank you for just digging in and wanting to learn more about yourself, wanting to improve on your personal and professional development during this time. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, Emotional intelligence is the key to creating your unique fingerprint, allowing you to be more successful in business and life and relationships. Now, I would like to open up the floor to see if just anybody has any questions that I can answer. I will try my best to answer them for you. But thank you. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Does anybody have any questions? I see a lot of thank yous coming in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Someone said they learned. That's awesome that you learned something. I'm so glad you learned something. A lot of every day is a learning, a journey of learning something new, something new about ourselves. Someone said this webinar has improved how they're engaged with other people. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Someone said mindfulness is humility, human ability to fully be present. Yes. Yes, it is. It's being fully present in the here and now. Hello, oh. ma'am. Yes. Uh, can you please stop slide share? Then you can uh, saw the question on your screen. Okay. Someone says, "What do I do when I'm so fed up with people talking down?" or ignoring my opinion. Well, one thing you can do when people talk down to you or ignore your opinion is talk to somebody who can listen. Sometimes we can't get across to the person that we're trying to convey our message to. So sometimes we have to speak through someone else. Um, I can just give you an example. Um, I have, you know, a coworker that you know, sometimes we don't see eye to eye and it's OK to not agree all the time. And sometimes it takes a third party, like I said, to see, you know, what I may be doing wrong when we're communicating or what she may be doing wrong when we're communicating. And it's OK to get feedback from someone else, to get someone else to come into the situation and kind of just give you guidance and let you know, am I being harsh? Am I being fair? So when you're fed up, if that person has to be a part of your circle, sometimes you can remove that person from your circle. You don't have to be around people who make you feel bad or talk down to you or ignore your opinion, unless it's a coworker. And then you can have a working relationship with that person, meaning you don't have to be friends with that person, but you know, you just be cordial and do your work and go about your business. But if this person is in your personal circle, I just advise, you know, removing that person from your circle or just having a talk with that person and letting them know that what they're doing is not OK. If you get the same response and they're just a friend or somebody that you associate with, remove that person from your circle. You have to set your boundaries because if not, people will overstep them.
Does anybody else have any questions? When facing a difficult situation, how to reject a person requesting help from you without offending his or her feelings? What you can do is let that person know, hey, I understand that you need this or need that. I would love to help you. But you just be honest with them about your limitations as it relates to helping them. Because a lot of times people ask us to do things or to help them, and they don't realize that we're going through the same things they're going through. We're going through a similar situation. And because they don't realize that and we don't tell them, and a lot of times what we do is just say, okay, we'll do it. If you don't tell a person what you're going through, they don't realize that you may need the same type of help or that you have to set those boundaries and those limits. Me being a therapist, people always depend on me to come, you know, my friends, family, they always call me and talk, want to talk to me about their problems and their issues because they know I'm a therapist. But I have to tell them sometimes, you know, this is what I do for a living. And sometimes it can be emotionally draining for me. I'm going through X, Y, and Z too. And so I just need you to respect my space and time. And it's not that I don't want to hear you out or I don't want to help you. It's that I can't help you at this time because at this time, I'm dealing with this. And a lot of times they're like, oh, my God, I didn't realize that you you had those problems. I didn't realize that you, you know, you get tired, too. I'm sorry. I'm just sitting here talking to you and not realizing that you have problems, too. So you just got to be honest with people and be open with people about your limitations and they'll know your boundaries. And once they know your boundaries, they'll be cautious about overstepping them. But you have to put them out there from the beginning so they know that you have limitations. What to do best for our health, physical, mental, and psychological when the pandemic is over? I would say the best thing to do for yourself is to get back to some of those things that you did before the pandemic. I know our world doesn't look the same right now. And so even in during this time, I'm finding myself having to substitute things that I used to do. I, I, I teach fitness. And so now I can't teach fitness first face to face anymore. So I teach fitness vir um, virtually online and it helps me to keep my physical fitness up. Um, I can't, you know, go to the beach like I want and do the things I do, but I did go re rent a beachside condo and sat on the beach. Uh, it, I didn't leave my condo because I didn't want to go on the beach where people were, but I was able to see the beach from my window and I was able to just look and enjoy the scenery from afar. So I would say when the pandemic is over, get back to the things that make you happy mentally, physically, spiritually, and psychologically. So you can get back to being yourself and you can get back to taking care of yourself and enjoying some of the things that you once enjoyed to the best of your ability. What's something you've achieved that you're most proud of and why? I think something that I've achieved that I'm most proud of is being able to, my mother um, passed about five years ago and I was able to take care of her and to dedicate my time to her. And she came to live with me for several years and I got to spend some quality time with her and just pour my love into her. And so I guess my my biggest achievement was being able to take care of the woman who birthed me, who took care of me, who loved me unconditionally. And I was able to show her that same love and take care of her. So I, I, that, that would be my biggest, biggest accomplishment. How to deal with hardships. Well, hardships are inevitable. We're going through some of them during this time. But I will ask you to call upon, if you're going through something, call upon 
something that you went through and what did you do during that time before that to help you through that time? And we call that resilience. And so in order to be resilient, you have to call upon if something happens to me, for instance, if I get in a car accident, if I got in a car accident and I got into a car accident again and I'm experiencing that same feeling, what did I do the last time to get over that feeling? I have to call upon those things. So hardships are inevitable. But in order to build resilience, we have to dig inside ourselves to find out the things that we did before to get through those similar type situations. Is there any more questions? Is there a chance for a lone pupil to socialize with others and how? <laughs> yes. Just so you know, believe not, I am an introvert. I'm a lone pupil. And I it took me a long time to step outside of my box in order to be able to do webinars and to be comfortable. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm having some difficulty. <laughs> <clears throat> but in order to, to to make myself feel more comfortable, I had to learn how to step outside that box. And I did that slowly. And it looks different for different people. But there's always a chance. Start with just making one friend, building that trust, building that relationship, and then extend upon that into building relationships with others. You may just want to start out with us. I have a small circle, very small. I have maybe one or two friends and that's fine with me. And I, I feel okay being alone. I feel okay not having a whole lot of people around me. So if that's just your, your um, personality, then it's okay. But if you want to socialize with others, find common ground, find what similarities you have with people and build relationships with those people. How we control our emotions during the pandemic, specifically our school activities, and what can we do? Well, how you can control your emotions is, first of all, you have to disconnect yourself from a lot of stuff that's going on during this time. Sometimes you have to turn the TV off. Sometimes you have to turn the internet off, turn the computer off, and do some of the things that you enjoy. Um, I've been reading a lot during the pandemic, and I'm not normally a reader, but I know that I can't always do some of the things that I used to do because those things cause me to have anxiety. And some of those things include watching TV or watching the news or looking at social media. And um, at school, school activities, you have to be able to disconnect from some of those things when it's time. Um, I try, I work at a school too. Um, but in order to separate myself from school activities, I do what I need to do at school. And then when I'm not doing school work or doing school stuff, I have to make sure I take time for me, which means sometimes just doing some of the things I enjoy. And sometimes that looks like, like nothing. Sometimes that looks like just relaxing and that's okay. How do we overcome stress and self-management? Overcoming stress is, is all about self-care and recognizing when you're stressed. So when we're able to recognize, you know, when we feel stressed, like I told you, writing in that diary, feeling, figuring out your triggers, figuring out when you feel stressed, then you can manage those emotions and manage that stress. But you got to know, first of all, what is causing it. In order to help yourself, you got to know what is causing it. And once you realize what is causing it, then you'll begin to understand some of the things that you can do to help eliminate it or reduce it. Hello, ma'am. 
Hello. Yeah, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to do it for you. I enjoyed it. Yeah, you're most welcome. Uh, this session will really help our audience to do better in their personal and professional life. All right. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. And again, thank you so much for giving us your valuable time and share your comprehensive knowledge with us all. All right. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. And dear audience, I would love to thank you all for attending to this session. I hope you learned something new and you will implement it in your life. Thank you so much for being with us. Our next webinar will be held on Mindset for Success on 11-11-20. Hope to see you all there and have a great day. Thank you all.